Hello, science family. Today, we are going to be focusing on something super important, nuclear power plants. You know, a lot of people don't completely understand where electricity comes from. We just use it. So today, we're going to dig deeper into where our electricity comes from and specifically how nuclear power plants work. So let's get to it. Let's do an overall idea of how we produce electricity for most of our homes and businesses. All right, so a nuclear reactor is actually quite similar to coal burning power plants, to natural gas burning power plants, and actually also to like hydropower and wind energy or wind power. So let's look into that. So obviously the main goal is to get electricity, right? In order to get electricity, majority of electricity that is made for us is made through a generator. Now, if you guys dig deeper into physics, you're gonna learn a lot more about generators, but to talk briefly about it, a generator has a magnet inside of it. If you spin that magnet, and that magnet is around coils of wire, you're actually going to create voltage, which is eventually going to create an electrical current. So by moving magnets around pieces of metal wire, you're actually gonna create the electricity. So that's the main goal here, is we've gotta find a way to spin these big giant generators. And to do that, we hook up a generator to what we call a turbine. A turbine spins and connects to the generator to spin the generator. So the question is, how are we going to spin this turbine? Or think of it like a, a big paddle wheel, all right? If you guys have ever seen a wind farm, right? We know that we have like a windmill. When the wind goes through it, we then spin our propellers. Well, those propellers are really just turbines, and those turbines are connected to a generator. But if we think about hydropower, the idea is that falling water, okay, so water falling down has what we call mechanical energy, energy of movement that can turn into energy that we can use for something. So when that water falls, it can fall over the turbine and spin it, which can turn a generator. All right, so wind can turn a turbine, falling water can turn a turbine. But what about nuclear power? How does that turn the turbine? Well, the main goal here is to create steam, high pressured steam. So think of it like high pressured steam is kind of like the wind. It's pushing, it has force behind it, and that can turn the turbine. So whether it's a coal burning power plant, a natural gas burning power plant, or a nuclear power plant, the end goal is to boil water to create high pressure steam. And that steam will then turn the turbine. So the only difference between a nuclear power plant and a coal burning power plant and a natural gas burning power plant is how we heat the water. To heat the water in a nuclear power plant, we're going to use a nuclear reaction we call fission. If it's a coal burning power plant, we're just gonna burn coal to heat up water. If it's a natural gas burning power plant, we're gonna burn natural gas, methane, in order to heat up the water. So we kind of work backwards from the electricity all the way to the starting point. Now let's move forward and learn about a nuclear reactor and how it works for a nuclear power plant. So the first place we're going to start is the core. The core is the very center of the nuclear power plant where we're going to get our energy from to start everything. So in a nuclear power plant, we know it's powered by fission. Remember that fission is splitting the atoms for the energy. So our energy is going to come from fission, which is splitting the atoms. Now remember, if you learned about fission from nuclear warheads and nuclear bombs, right? We know that fission can create a huge amount of energy and heat from a very small amount of material. Well, we're going to use that huge amount of heat to eventually boil water. Remember, if you boil the water, you're gonna create the steam. And if you create the steam, we can pressurize it to turn that big paddle wheel, the turbine. So we have to be realistic though. A fission reaction is incredibly high energy and we have to make sure we're being safe. So the number one thing we have to do inside the core is we have to have our fission reaction under water, all right? We want that water in order to slow down the fission reaction, have it not overheat, because if it overheats, you boil off that water and now the core is going to be exposed. If the core is exposed, the fission reaction could get so hot that it could start to melt the containment building that it's held in. If it gets so hot, you're going to start melting metal where it's going to actually melt out of the containment building and cause what's called a meltdown. That would be very bad. Remember, a fission reaction gives off radiation. 
So if this fission reaction ends up burning outside of its containment building, that radiation would be exposed to the outside environment and atmosphere. Very, very bad. The good news is only two meltdowns have ever happened in the history of the world so far with nuclear power. And nuclear power has been around since the late 1940s after the atomic bomb was created. So it's been a pretty good track record, but that's nothing to ignore. That's a serious concern. So water is number one. We have to keep water on the fission reaction. And remember that water is going to heat up anyways to eventually turn to steam. So we need that, but it's an important part. The other thing that we need to consider is having what's called control rods. Control rods are actually inside of the core and control rods can be lowered down into the fission reaction. Now, in order for a fission reaction to occur, you need neutrons constantly bouncing around, creating more fission reactions. So think of like ping pong balls all over the place, bouncing everywhere. If you put the control rods in, they actually absorb many of the neutrons, which will then stop and slow down the reaction. So if there's no neutrons, there's no fission. So a control rod will actually help take up those neutrons so the fission reaction stops. So as long as we are underwater, that fission reaction, and we have the control rods that we can enter in to the fission reaction if need be, we can control the actual nuclear reaction. So you've heated up now because of fission, we need to create steam. Now remember that steam is gonna come in and eventually turn the turbine. So we pressurize the steam to turn the turbine. That's the big paddle wheel. The paddle wheel or turbine then turns the big generator. And because you have a huge generator spinning, you then create electricity, which can eventually be sent out into the world to businesses and homes. So if you really think about it in a nutshell, it's a really quick idea. We're gonna have a fission reaction to create heat. Heat's going to create steam. Steam's going to turn the turbine. Turbine's going to turn the generator, all right? Now, the question you might be thinking is, wait a minute, if a fission reaction is radioactive, then how on earth are we creating steam? Is this going out into the environment? Is this polluting the environment? That's a super great question. If we focus in on this diagram a little closer, you will notice that where fission occurs, there is a closed loop of water. So this water right here that I'm circling, this is radioactive water. It's getting extremely hot, but notice it never leaves that loop. So the water that touches the fission reaction constantly circulates around. So how on earth, if it doesn't get out, can you create steam? Well, you know if you have hot water in a pipe, that pipe is gonna get very hot. So right where the pipe water forgive me, the water that's touching the pipe on the outside will get heated. So this contaminated water that's flowing is actually heating pipes. These pipes will then heat up clean water that isn't radioactive, and that clean water will then turn to steam and turn the turbine. After that, once that steam is hot, it's going to get cooled back down. We'll talk about that in the next slide, and then we can reuse it again. The same thing happens with our contaminated water. Contaminated water heats up the outside water. We know when we give off heat, we cool down. So this water cools down and circulates back into the fission reaction to help control the reaction. As it does that, the water heats up again, heats up the pipes, which heats up some more water and circles back. So it's a big cyclical motion where we heat up water, cool it down, heat up water, cool it down. The beautiful thing is that the radioactive water never leaves the building and the clean water that isn't radioactive can continue to turn the turbine and then cool back down again. So when we cool the steam down, all right, we need to cool it back down to water. And the beautiful thing is when the water cools in the closed loop, that goes right back into the reactor to cool it. The steam that's out of the closed loop that turns the turbine can get cooled off by outside cool water as well and then reused again. So we keep reusing our water, which is a great thing. Also notice that I haven't talked about anything with pollution whatsoever. That's a super important part of nuclear power we're gonna talk about. But you may wonder, how do you clean up, or not clean up, but cool down all this crazy hot steam and water? Well, you need an entire lake. So outside of nuclear power plants, there are usually what we call cooling lakes. The cooling lakes pumps in water to cool down those hot pipes that are full of steam. 
and then we pump it back into the lake so that that heat can dissipate throughout all the water. So if you are a big avid fisher, you've probably been to a cooling lake before. The fishing is supposed to be great there. The warmer water from the lake, because it's cooling down those hot pipes, keeps the lake a nice warm temperature. And as we know, the warmer the temperature, fish are cold blooded, so they're metabolisms are very active. So supposedly they bite on your lure a lot more because of the warmer water. But anyways, we use giant cooling lakes in order to cool down those hot pipes full of steam. So again, we're just heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down. Now, the beautiful thing about nuclear power is the low waste. So we're gonna use the same water over and over again. No radiation is leaked, right? Unless there's an accident. We'll talk about that, but unless there's an accident, no radiation is leaked whatsoever. Uranium, it doesn't take much uranium to power a city. So compared to the train loads of coal we would burn every single day, uranium truly, truly, truly gives off energy without any pollution. There's no carbon dioxide, there's no carbon monoxide, there's no sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide. Think of like smog that smells like rotten eggs in that. So. There's no greenhouse gases given off. The water isn't polluted. It's amazing. It's a huge amount of energy with barely little waste. In fact, every two to three years when a nuclear power plant is refueled, now you have that radioactive old uranium that's used that needs to be stored. Now, we're not ignoring the fact that that uranium that's used is, is pretty dangerous. For 10,000 years, that's going to be at high levels of radiation that are dangerous. So we have to store that used fuel on site. Right now, we have no official rules on how to store it in the ground. Yucca Mountain in Nevada was eventually supposed to be the place we put all our nuclear waste. But with funding and people fighting it, nothing has really happened with that. So the crazy thing about it is we're creating a waste that we don't exactly know what to do with yet, that we can't get rid of for over 10,000 years, which is a really, really long time in a human's lifespan, right? but we're still looking for best ways to figure out how to use that used fuel. The beautiful thing is not too far from here, Argonne National Lab. You may have walked around Waterfall Glen, but Argonne National Lab actually works on, with France, how to find ways to take this used spent fuel and use it for other forms of energy. I have no doubt that in the next 10, 20 years, we'll figure out a way to continue to use this waste so that we can keep getting energy out of it and also make it less dangerous. The power of ingenuity is everywhere in the world. Maybe one of you can help better figure that out so that we can use nuclear power, but keep it even cleaner and safer. But again, no greenhouse gases is a huge draw for the world right now with climate change going on. So nuclear power might be more and more important in the following you know, 10, 20, 30 years in order to keep things under control with our carbon emissions. But that's gonna take a lot of convincing because a lot of people are against it. And there's a good reason for it. Let's talk about those accidents. The closest to home accident that's ever happened in the United States was in Pennsylvania. It was before you were born in 1979, students, but in Pennsylvania, bottom line was this. There was some human error and also some instrument error. We ended up taking too much water out of the reactor. Because of that, the reaction got way too hot and no official meltdown occurred but there was partial meltdown, meaning that the uranium rods in that were starting to melt. So we got really close to having a serious problem, but in the end, nobody died, and we just shut down that reactor. Was it a mess? Was it a big scare? Absolutely. Did we have to evacuate the surrounding towns? Yes. But in the end, nothing terrible happened besides just, you know, fear, which is not a good thing. Then seven years later, the worst happened. Chernobyl had a meltdown. Now, Chernobyl had a slightly different nuclear reactor than the United States uses, but in the end, they used graphite in order to moderate or slow down the nuclear reaction. In the end, they were doing a test that probably wasn't the best idea. They caught the thing that was supposed to slow the fission reaction down, they caught it on fire. Because of that, the nuclear power plant, I should say the nuclear reactor burned down and also the firefighters that fought these fires directly when it started, many of them died from the exposure of radiation. Now here's the crazy thing. If you look online, there's conflicting information about whether or not more cancers were created because of this radiation leak in the surrounding areas. 
The World Health Organization says that there actually wasn't any big increase in the amount of cancers created after Chernobyl burned down. Obviously, the initial people who fought the fires and were heroes to, you know, contain this uh, gave their lives for it. But it sounds like a couple hundred people died where some people think millions have died because of cancer. The problem is I, I don't know the right answer. Looking through all the data, there's such conflicting information that I don't know if it really wasn't as big of a deal as people made it out to be, or if this was one of the worst, most terrible things that have ever happened on the planet. So it's really confusing. And I think it brings up a good point that Sometimes information you get, it's hard to decipher what's credible and what's not and what's the truth and what's not. So you can do some more research on that and see for yourself just how bad it was. Our very last slide fi finishes close to home as far as time. It was only 2011 when Japan, unfortunately, had some reactors meltdown. The reason, what a, what a weird occurrence. A tsunami that was caused by an earthquake hit the power plants. They ended up losing power and their backup systems failed and basically they couldn't keep the fission reactions cool enough. The tops blew off a couple of them. There was a meltdown and unfortunately tons of radiation was leaked. The surrounding areas had to be evacuated and uh, there's still radiation near the ocean that's leaking in. We're not sure the long-term effects what's going to happen. Is it scary? Yes. Is it unknown? Absolutely. Is it a huge mess to clean up? Absolutely. But if you think of since 1950, when nuclear power plants came online to create energy, until now, there's only been two radiation leak accidents that have been big enough to spread worldwide where people knew about it, Matt. It's a really good track record. And for the lack of pollution they've created versus coal burning power plants, and remember that creates particulate matter that can lead to lung issues in that, it's, a, it's an incredibly clean source of energy and one we might have to look at again in order to help our planet, even though there's risks involved. The idea here is for this class for you to be better educated in all things nuclear so you can form your own educated opinion. Are you pro? Are you against? Are you in between? Are you not sure? But at least you have the knowledge and background information when learning more about nuclear chem to make a decision one day if you need to vote whether your community should open up a nuclear power plant or not. All right. So thanks for hanging in there, science fam. Great job. We're slowly peeling away the idea and information that most people don't understand, which is about nuclear chem. Have a great one.